So the reason I came to Kegel is precisely what Walker presented. My employer noticed I have a PhD in machine learning and they wanted to invest more. So as they asked me to take a lead, but I had forgot. So I looked for a place where I could learn about state of the art, found Kaggle, tried, and now I'm addicted. It's a, Kaggle is a legal drug, that's the truth. They don't say it, but you know each time you submit, there is adrenaline, what will be the score? You wake up, so you lose 10 uh, ranks <laughs> when you're lucky. Look, yesterday I was 10, now I'm 11, so. <laughs> and thanks to point in a competition where I finish, I believe, 17, so it's Kaggle is tough. And it's not going to, to be easier. Yeah, so um, uh, my, my talk will be on time series. And then uh, I will speak about fraud detection, but not only. So uh, I thought I had a slide about me with a joke. Oh, yes. So for some reason, I'm, I'm not updating my picture. So I don't <laughs> know why. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm the oldest competition GM, maybe. <coughs> All right, so that's me. Uh, I, I've been first in discussions. That's, uh, uh, I came GM first in discussion before competition. Now it's my colleague Chris uh, Duty who's first. Uh, maybe I share less, but, uh, oh, they share more, so that's good. Um, I'm glad I took the picture before being 11. All right, so um, some people say, oh, once you're a GM, uh, are you still motivated? Yes. You can't get uh, a medal if you're not motivated, right? And uh, Jiba has twice as many medals as me, so there are people even more motivated. All right. Um, and I'm, work, uh, uh, I'm working at NVIDIA. Competing is part of our job. I'd say we spent half time on Kaggle, half time during work days, half time additional during weekends. No, seriously, Kaggle is fun, but if you want to be in top 10 in a competition, you don't do get it by working half an hour a day. But you can get benefit from Kaggle. What I tell people who, have, uh, who can't spend too much time, in the morning you spend half an hour, look at your past result, send something, when you're back, you look at the result, think a bit. Next morning, uh, try another idea. So with half an hour a day, you can achieve good results. You won't be in top 10 on Kaggle, but not everybody can can be there, but you will learn, all right? Um, and I would say I was seven before I joined NVIDIA, so before it became my job, so it's possible to, to go there. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to speak about time series. So sales forecasting is a well-known use case. Fraud detection is a use case as well. Recommend our system, like yesterday. It's time series as well. Right, yesterday, did you notice that more than the session had no past? So it was not really a time series, but part, partly. So basically, you're given one or several time series. And you want to, to predict future value of the time series. Usually, there is a gap when you put a model in pro so you train a model, you know some data up to a date, you train a model, you deploy it in production. Um, when I started uh, working on tooling at IBM, I met customers where the gap was seven months. Because they were recording from say R into Java, the models. Now you have uh, uh, cloud services where the gap is smaller, but still, there is a process, there is 
So there is always a gap. So if there is a, so I've seen, so a first mistake people do, for instance, at NVIDIA we had a project and the gap was about two weeks. Um, yet, the people train model to forecast starting here with no gap. So they, they had to forecast say four, uh, four weeks or six weeks, six periods. They should have put a two period gap, but no, they started predicting. So they had quite good result and in production, results were not as good. And the reason was there was a gap. So that's the first mistake people do. And don't be optimistic, it's better to train with a larger gap. Um, so mind the gap. So there are many models. I mentioned Facebook profit because of ease of use. Um, so it's easy to use, let's say. Let's <laughs> but it's, it's a good baseline if you, it's slow, so that's a problem. But it's a good, uh, good baseline. Um, the standard statistical model, ARIMA and variations. So uh, they are called autoregressive. They are good baseline. So if you start a time series forecasting, it can be a good idea to just run these well-known models. At least you have something to compare with. And that's also something people often forget. They want to do what Walter says. Oh, there is this new TFT transformer for time series. The fact that they have one time series with 20 points, no matter, TFT. <laughs> so it will learn, uh, well, it's useless in that case. So start simple. That's the advice I gave to the team uh, I advised yesterday. Build a simple time, statistic-based uh, uh, baseline. Then you improve. So you could just use these models, but um, I want to present something that is well known by experienced Kaglers, but not so much known in industry, is to transform a time series forecasting into a regression problem. And the interest is you will create models that learn something different. So when you take a regression model and you blend with the, these autoregressive models, you usually get a significant boost. So <coughs> how do we do it? First, let's simplify it. Let's predict one value and say the problem is to predict a given value after a given gap. I will, uh, I will show how we go back to sequence after. Uh, so yes, uh, I mentioned how to do it, but I will, I will go back. So the first thing is for each, so remember, we need to forecast the future. We have data up to this point. We create a set of examples, predict the last known value with data known before the gap, and then predict the period before with one period less of known value, etc. Okay? Is that clear? And very importantly, you keep the same gap for all the samples. Then, um, you want to train a model on all these samples at once. So you have to transform the history, and a model that takes, say, XGBoost to, to name one I like, but it could be a uh, linear regression, who knows, or deep learning model. Um, you create features from the history based, uh, that summarize what happened before. Uh, and you do it row by row. So it, each row can be several time series. Huh? So typical, the last value is often the best predictor. 
it's like weather. Um, the best single predictor for weather is to say tomorrow weather will be the same as today. It's like 60, 70% accuracy. It's hard to beat. Uh, average of last week, average of last month, min max to capture uh, if there is a lot of volatility. You can do it by months. You can also take the same period previous year if there is a seasonality. Uh, so it's just common sense. So you aggregate for each row before, you aggregate the time series, and you get features for each row. And again, each row can be several time series, so you can aggregate across time series as well. For us in sales, you can aggregate the sales of the category of the product and give it as input as well. And then you create a new table. For each row, you have the features and you have the target. And here, that's a tabular data regression problem. And then you can use whatever, uh, so I mentioned gradient boosting, XGBoost, like GBM, CatBoost. But uh, depending on the target, some uh, linear model could be good. There was a competition like, uh, it was a wiki, Wikipedia traffic forecasting. I think, uh, so I got second, but the fourth place was just a weighted sum of features like this. It was very hard to beat. So it was a simple model, frankly. It was a one-liner. Some competition were one with very simple models. It uh, has to be the right one, but uh, okay. So now I'm, I'm, I will discuss. Sorry. So now I have a tabular data, but it's not really tabular data because you have a time row, and people forget this. So now they have a table, and they say, okay, I will use cross-validation because I'm uh, an experienced data scientist, so I will split my rows randomly in folds and train. Say, two folds, very random, right? <laughs> well, this is as, as likely as any other uh, choice, huh? so it could be random, but still, and then you train, you train a, a model on these two set of rows, evaluate on these two. You get good result. You do the same for the other one, you get good results. You go in production, something goes wrong. You debug, you tune, you call up to now for uh, two months, it's worse. So your CV score goes up and the production performance, or if you have an independent test, it goes down. So why? Because this is in the future of this. So you train on the future of your validation here. That's a mistake. That's the single thing to not do in time series, and that everybody does at least once. And it happened even in some Kaggle competition in the early days, well, early for me. Um, and sometimes it's quite hidden, it's not obvious. So for instance, in the current auto competition, this happens. So if you look on the forum and the host say yes, but we could not find a way to not do it. So they are aware, so if they are aware, so then Kagglers will exploit it, which leads to model that may not be the best in practice, but that's, as long as the host knows, uh, that's okay. So don't do this. Never ever use for training data which is in the future validation. That's the only thing to remember. So if you remember one thing from my talk, that's it. So 
So what you have to do is time-based folds. So fold zero, you pick a, a, a date, what's before is training, what's after is validation. For another fold, you pick another date. Okay? And that's it. That's time-based cross-validation. So that's with two folds. I could have created one fold where I only use this for training, this for validation. Uh, yeah, and that's it here. All right. Detrending. Oh, okay. So that's a second. It's funny. Um, I wish deep learning community was spending as much energy in trying to understand why gradient boosting works well instead of claiming it does not work well. It's true that in some cases a deep learning model will be better, even on time series it, it happened more than in other tabular data. But um, gradient boosting uh, works well, uh, works well often. And one thing people say, oh, gradient boosting, decision trees, they can't extrapolate. So first, that's true. Linear model can extrapolate. A polynomial model can extrapolate. And we have good example, someone fitted a, a cubic polynomial on COVID cases and the model fit well at some point and then uh, went, so it led to a disaster in, uh, in public health policy. So it's not because you can extrapolate that you extrapolate well. So that's a reverse argument. But there is a simple way to, so for instance, if you have a time series that grows over time, like uh, uh, Kegel Prize, if I heard well, <laughs> um, if you use XGBoost, it's true, it, it will not predict increasing values on you in the future. But if you have a trend like this, it's easy to detrend. Instead of predicting the next value, you fit something to the trend and you predict the delta or the residual. And uh, you could fit, for instance, an ARIMA model, but even simpler. You could just predict the change compared to the mean of last month. So if it grows uh, by 10 every month, you will have a model that predicts an increase of 10 every month easily. If your growth is exponential, it's 10%, then the, uh, the inc improvement increase over time. But if you take the log of the target, I, did, I should have put it, uh, exponential growth becomes linear. And then if you take, you compare with the mean of the uh, uh, reference period, you will uh, let uh, decision trees learn uh, uh, to predict correctly. So modify the target. Uh, so you can start, as I said, simple, say the, the mean of the last week, the last month, the value of previous year, what have you, a combination, a linear model. So the baseline I said you should start with, remember, a simple linear model uh, aggregating statistics. But you can also say you find you have enough data, you, you, fit a good deep learning model, could be TFT or homegrown or what have you, sequence to sequence. Then you can still use gradient boosting on the residual, the difference between the deep learning prediction and the target. Uh, in, uh, in this Wikipedia traffic uh, prediction, that's what I did. It was first time I did the NN, so my NN was certainly not the best but maybe it was a tenth on the leaderboard and moved to second place with uh, XGBoost. So the point is, history should be, 
you should create features with history, but you can also transform the target. And this is not just for time series. For instance, in Barcelona, uh, there was an NP competition with uh, a skewed regression target. Um, so I was not there, but what I would have tried first is to take the log of target or something to, to make it closer to a normal distribution to his uh, learning. I don't know if it would have worked, but people often forget, spend a lot of time in feature engineering, but target engineering is important as well. All right. Um, something I, I mentioned a bit. So now you, you say you train for this fold. You have three periods. Typically, you would have more than three. And you validate on this. Here you have two, you may have more, you validate on these ones. In many cases, the most recent behavior is more important. So you should put a weight on the last period of training. You should put more weight than older. So say, for example, in Exibus, you have sample weights. In deep learning, you could put a loss per uh, you could weight the loss per sample. So you, you add weight to the recent ones. If there is a yearly uh, seasonality, you also put weight for the same period the previous year. So it's called recency bias and seasonality. I don't know if seasonality bias is, is a phrase, but. Uh, and this is very effective. You could also, uh, as I mentioned in the target, uh, so it's different from what I said, where you compute the residual compared to the last known period. Here you want it's not, it's, it's, a, it's orthogonal, you can do both. All right, so now uh, let's go back to sequence to sequence. What I presented is how to predict one. Uh, so that's an advantage of deep learning models that they can predict a sequence. Uh, gradient boosting is designed to predict one value. Statistical models, uh, the, the classical ones, same, they predict one value. So how do we go from models who predict one point to sequence? So if the gap is small, really small, so there are use cases uh, like this. Basically, uh, you have your model, you, you train it without gap, and then in production, you apply it to, so uh, I should have put the now is here. You put it to data up to, up to now, predict next period. Then you include next period as additional history predict the next period, and you iterate. This is simple. If your prediction is really good, it's good. Not really good, because the, the errors compound. So if this is a bit wrong, this will be a, a bit more wrong, etc. So it can diverge. Yet, this is what people do. Huh? So, you must have a zero gap, which is unlikely, and error compound. So, another way, which is costly, is to train one model for each possible gap. So, say you have to, so you train one model to predict with the, the gap, one model to predict with a gap plus one period, etc. So if you have n period to predict, you, you train n models. Mm. 
this works, but uh, it's expensive. And you lose a bit because this model should not be much different from this one. You have a larger gap, but so you may have some, uh, when you use this method, you may have some noise in the, pre so non-smooth predictions, which are just due to the fact that you train n time uh, a model. So another way is to train one model with n times more samples. So from an original uh, period, you create n sample. For each of the period, you have to predict with different gaps. So the original goal was to predict this. If I aligned it correctly, yes. So that's our original problem. We split this into four, say this is four periods. So we create four samples. The same history, but the difference is a gap. So when we turn into features, we have the same history features. We have the four targets, and we have an extra colon, which is a gap. <coughs> so if there is something common from this history that helps predict the model will capture it at once and only refine differences due to the gap and you can combine with a time-based split so the first period is split into n samples the next period so you move by one here, you create n samples, move by one. So you will have the gap, the gap colon that iterates. This, these four ones are the same, these four ones are the same, etc. And these are the four period of, for the, the first sequence. This works well. Then when you do cross-validation, not only you must respect time, but don't split in the middle of, uh, of, of one of these, okay? When you create folds, one group here is one unity in the fold. And the, all these must be in the same fold, always. So the time series, you have gap increase and then the gap restarts but the history moves by one period okay that's what it does all right so now all i said was for general time series it was motivated by exibus but you could again apply deep learning models you could apply uh, statistical models uh, whatever suits you uh, now, application to sales forecasting. So in sales, there are some refinements. The target is not symmetric. It's not the same to predict more demand than actual. That's one thing. And under predict, so predict less demand than the real demand. The difference is if you predict more demand, you will create an in a larger inventory. You won't sell all of it, so you still have products, but normally you will sell the products later. Whereas if you did not anticipate all the demand, you have your inventory, when it is all sold, that's it. So you lose money, you lose revenue. So in a way, it's better to predict more if you have to make a mistake, it's better to overestimate than underestimate. Except some products are perishable. 
for instance, dairy, uh, yogurt, milk, whatever. After a date, you cannot sell, sell them. So if you have too much inventory, you will just uh, trash it. So that's not good. And also, there are products with a deadline, like Christmas trees. After December 24, they are useless, right? So uh, depending on what you sell, you may want to weigh differently an overestimation error and an underestimation error. Um, and if, if you're in that use case, look for something called quantile regression. The idea is to weigh differently the loss if prediction is greater than ground truth. So that's one weight. And the loss when the error is in the other way has a different weight. So if you weight over prediction, like four times more than under prediction, you will compute the first of the fi of, uh, of five quantile. So it will make an error for over prediction formed four times more than under. I hope I, I had it in the right uh, way, but you get the idea. So don't forget this. Sales is tricky. Uh, not only because predicting is tricky, but there is this. The other thing, which is more subtle maybe, you train based on past sales. But past sales may be what they are because there were no more product to sell. So you run out of stock. So you, had, you actually had a, a larger demand, but you could not meet it and you recorded your sales. So if you train a model, it will predict your sales, not the demand. So if you can have an indication that you run out of stock, uh, okay, good. Um, so it's better if you can have information about when you were out of stock. That's very important. Um, also, this, uh, this is obvious, but if you don't have the data, you can't model it. If you run an ad campaign, normally sales would search for something. So if your model doesn't know there was a, an ad campaign, it will over predict in the future if there is no sales, uh, if there is no ad campaign, right? Holidays, events, what have you. So sales in general is multi-variate or multi-series to one series prediction, okay? Um, and that's where the statistical models, autoregressive, have their limits. So remember when I said uh, you, you create features, you can create features across time series, and that's useful for this. Um, yeah, product cannibalization is also something difficult. If you run out of stock for one product, people will buy something else. So you want to also model the category sales, and then you have a hierarchy of predictions, and they won't agree, so then you have to, to see what you do with difference between the, the category prediction and the aggregated element predictions. Um, that's, so there you need to, to discuss with business people. It's beyond machine learning. All right. Um, recommender systems. Uh, one way to look is, is just a time series per user. So it depends on the type some are session based like yesterday. So very short history or no history. In some others, they, you have uh, an account, so they know it's you, so they have a longer history. In that case, uh, you have some history. Last time you visited the website, now you're here. What is it you want to see? 
there is a gap. And the gap, not only it's a production gap, but uh, it can be larger per user. It's the last time you saw the person. So everything I said applies. Uh, recency bias is very, especially, for instance, we worked on a, on a video recommendation like TikTok, no, not TikTok for another company. It's hard to beat the baseline based on the most popular items in the last few hours. It's hard to beat. But, um, so recency bias can be very important. But what I said about do not leak information it's very important. So let's say you do, you have this data, and you do the, the sampling as I explained. So you consider, let's predict two days uh, recommendations. We use a gap, and here are all the user interactions. So each line is a user here. So you, will, you may have one million or whatever time series. And then you say, I will just replicate, but using one day less here and predict yesterday, etc. And you do the falls as I explained. You, you may think, oh, I'm fine, except here you have a user ID and you know I the interaction of that user here. And if you look, oh, here you know the interaction of that user as training data here. And here it's used as validation. But you can link the two because you have the same user ID here and here. That's a leak that happens when you have user IDs. So usually you don't have it. Um, so recommendation is to not use the user ID in your features. Or if you do, um, you just uh, replicate the user IDs. The, the model must not know that the, the prediction here is to be found here. Um, if there is a way on Kaggle, the Kagglers will find it and exploit. So um, don't in, in, in real life machine learning, don't have, don't let the model find the ground truth of some of its validation elsewhere in the training data. It's very important. And it, this, this kind of leak happens, so it depends on how you encode the history, etc. but it can happen. Um, fraud detection. So I will not speak much about models. Uh, you can see fraud detection as time series with a binary outcome. So given the history of the customer, is a current transaction action a fraud? Um, issue for machine learning, but good for business, it's in balance. The number of fraud is small. Uh, so it's bad for us, but good for people we work with. Uh, the other one, the ground truth comes with a delay. For instance, in credit card transaction, uh, you know for sure there was a fraud two months after the transaction. It's two months. At least in one case I work. And it comes from um, a legal department, so very different from the operations. So it's a, in a different system. So just getting the data so uh, can be really a problem. And second, banks, for instance, they are not proud of, uh, of uh, uh, frauds. So th they are very reluctant about sharing data about fraud. Same is true for IT intrusions, for instance. You know, uh, 
government had to put in law obligation to disclose intrusion. Because companies, they don't want to admit uh, someone uh, tricked them. The other thing is, so ground truth comes with a delay. But fraudsters, they adapt. If you put in production a model that catch a way to fraud, they will find it does not work and they try something else. So the shelf life of a model is short. So that's why using time series may not be the best way. Another way is to treat this as anomaly detection. So you try to have a model that predicts the normal behavior in, in, a, in, a, in a way and compare with the actual and report deviations. <coughs> this is more robust. First, it can uh, react to unknown new threats, uh, whereas the other one, you must have seen the, the fraud to learn from it. Uh, Grand truth hard to get. So in one case, and I will finish with this, I was asked to, to help 300 million use uh, card transaction. I say, good, good. Do we have uh, ground truth? Yes, in this other file. I get the file had 1,800 label transaction and six fraud. And these guys, they were it was two years, they were asking every machine learning company to help. In two years, they could have labeled 100,000 uh, transactions. So I told them, label stuff, oh, thank you, and the guy got fired after a while because that went nowhere, I mean. Um, all right. In my last case, I was asked, uh, come, come, we, we can't uh, get a good model. We have the ground truth. And this time was the opposite. All data was labeled. I say, well, well, well. Are you sure it's a real ground truth? Yes, 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 yes. Can you ask, oh, they're on vacation. It was around Christmas. Uh, so I work, create a, a model. Very good. Uh, oh, the other trick, given it's... In balance, it's easy to have like 99% accuracy. You predict no fraud. So I, I mentioned it. Uh, don't use accuracy in this case. In fact, the ground truth was a prediction of a legacy uh, system they wanted to replace. So I just trained a model to replace another model. So check what you're doing. Is, are you really solving the right problem? And uh, that's it. Uh, that's what uh, I covered. So I don't know. Do we have time for a few questions? We make it. Oh, wonderful. Do we have questions? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. I'll first. be around uh, if we can't cover all. What's your name? Uh, my name is Meng. And uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very, very interesting. Thank so you. you mentioned the three model for the tabular regression for the forecasting. First is a recursive. We predict and then we use it in future and uh, predict next day. Second, uh, use different uh, several model. And second uh, is, the, uh, and the third is the add the feature, get in the model, uh, which one you, we are the last one. The last one? Yeah, it's a single model with more data. If you have more data and less model, it's a kind of regularization. The danger, yeah, I should say, what I learned on Kaggle is to not overfit. Uh, so if you train N models, you, it, it's more powerful than one model, so you may overfit more easily. Yeah, do you have some uh, special measure? Because we add this one column in the feature, maybe we have 100 feature, and uh, what we can do, uh, we just let the model to learn the feature is very important. 
how do you, well feature selection that that could be a presentation my only it's I never do feature selection without training models. I see people, there are publications, you know, information value, blah, blah, and, but they were designed for linear regression uh, for another model. So yeah, Exibus, they may just remove good features. So yeah, you can, it's, you can reduce the number of features, but you train a model, you set a baseline, using cross-validation, then you try with less features, train, compare the score. Don't do feature selection. For instance, I've seen people, they remove feature with missing values, but gradient boosting, they don't care. So, and the fact that a value is missing may be a signal, so um, that's an advantage of our deep learning, for instance. So it, or if you want to remove, you create a binary, with uh, saying that's a missing value and you put the mean or whatever in it, but don't remove the signal. So yeah, feature selection is, uh, is an interesting topic for next time. Thank you. Okay, there was a question over there. Uh, you can just answer three of them. Yes, thank you very much. It was very interesting. And I, uh, I'm going back with some more things to try, thanks. Um, my question is uh, relative to history, historical uh, data. Uh, in finance, when you want to predict sales, you can predict sales on a daily basis, maybe for marketing and sales teams, but for finance people, they look at monthly figures. So if you have a five-year history of uh, sales, just 60 data points. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> what, what can you do with that? It's interesting, I'm actually talking, uh, last week I met a finance company, and not only they had this, so they had to predict weekly or monthly, the gap is nine months. <laughs> not because of them, because, uh, well, I can't disclose probably, but so, because of some regulation. And they have five year period, so yeah, they have 60 points, if we go to weekly, it's more noisy. Then I would do this, but with uh, a linear model or something simple. But uh, li with linear model, given they are linear, you, you may need to engineer the target. And uh, for instance, if it's exponential growth, you want to take log. You want something that is learnable or general linear model, let's say. Uh, I would use a general linear model with a link function so you can uh, capture, uh, for instance, if it's a binary, you use logistic regression, it's a general linear model. Uh, but yeah, 60 point, if you have one time series, 60 point, don't use Exibus, don't use deep learning, it's too comp they are too, too powerful. So a, li a linear model or maybe polynomial, but keep it simple. And, uh, and put regularization on. Thank you. Okay, you can pass it here. Okay, uh, time for last question. Agri was first. But there will be time for questions during the coffee break, don't worry. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here all day. Can you tell your name? Yeah. Boton, my name is Boton, Boton Agri. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. It was very clear and very uh, smart how you uh, presented the, the basics. Of Can the you repeat? <laughs> <laughs> I will recall. It, it was very, very, very clear and very simple the way how you presented, although it's very complex. So everyone who is uh, approaching this problem, it, uh, it's, it could be quite messy, right? You cannot see the, the simple uh, things behind. I would like to ask you about the fraud detection, the, concept drift or the changes of the fraudster behaviors and you told that the best would be to use a outlier detection model but sometimes what i feel it's 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 not the not the solution because you you don't have those uh, input data sets what we could so they are drifting in a way that you cannot catch yeah and uh, so that's also another topic um because my the gap between my PhD and back to machine learning, I did mathematical optimization operations research, which is all about computing decisions. Machine learning, 
output is not a decision. It's some probability, some re relevance, some uh, what have you ranking. So it, it has to be transformed. For instance, in a fraud detection system, you need to have some business logic that takes the output of machine learning and recommend. So for instance, if you have an outlier detection, you could say if, the, if it's a probability. If the probability is low, you just accept. If it's high, you reject. And in between, you route to a, a human. But I agree, it's, uh, especially for fraud detection, IT intrusion, etc., you must have human in the loop at a point for making the decision in, uh, in the gray area. Yeah. So, yeah, machine, something people, so I, I assume people here know about machine learning, so you don't make the mistake, but business people, they read in newspaper blogs that AGI is at the corner, Terminator is the, is the other way, <laughs> AI does everything. No, um, AI gives you a prediction, kind of probability, and no more except reinforcement learning that is designed to learn actions. But in general, our models in production, they just compute information that can be used to make a decision. So it's, it's, it's important to set expectations. So one question I always ask when I start a project or go to a project, I ask how do you validate? So that was the topic. The second question is, assume you have a perfect model. It predicts perfectly. How do you use it? How does it really improve? So uh, let me, I will finish with this anecdote. So I don't know if it was fabricated. I read it. Uh, a team predicted customer churn. So it, for subscriptions uh, service, the marketing wanted to know which customers are likely to not renew. And they had their data science build a model, quite good. And then they gave it to, to their customer support saying, call the people who are most likely to uh, not renew and offer them uh, something. They started and the calls were going like this. Hello, Mr. X, uh, I'm from uh, company Y. Ah, oh, that's good, I wanted to renew, let's do it. <laughs> so they accelerated. Uh, I wanted to stop to cancel my subscription, let's do it. So in fact, they accelerated cancellations. <laughs> no, but, so machine learning did what they wanted, predict people at risk, but the business action was a disaster. So, uh, well, I have other anecdotes like this. So when you're on a machine learning project, make sure there are business people who want to consume what you do and consume it correctly. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation.